buildings. Instead of being barriers that separate us from nature, can buildings be bridges that connect us with nature? Can windows, walls, roofs deepen our connections with light, air, sound? Today, we are all talking about smart cities. Cities are complex living organisms made up of their smallest unit, the building. If we want smart cities, we need smart and sustainable buildings. What do we mean by smart buildings? Perhaps the first thought that comes to us involves gadgets, which are electronically driven and internet enabled. To do fancy things like operating lights, fans, curtains, air conditioners. But is this the width and height of our imagination about what smart buildings can be? Before we infuse an external intelligence into our buildings, can our buildings intrinsically be smart, by themselves be intelligent? There are several ways in which they can. Design, suitable materials, suitable techniques for using those materials, response to climate, resource efficiency through water, waste, energy, renewable sources of energy, many sources. Today, let us see three principles of design for energy efficiency. Lighting, thermal comfort, and acoustics. The first one being lighting. The sun is our source of infinite light. Outdoor lighting level on a typical day, on a clear day, is 10,000 lux. And what do we need indoors for most of our daily activities? Between 250 and 500 lux. So when we need only a fraction of the outdoor light indoors, why do we switch on lights during the day in most of our workplaces? In schools, colleges, offices, banks, everywhere. Why can't we simply control the amount of light which is already there outside, filter it and bring in exactly what we need? One of the most sophisticated gadgets adept at doing exactly this is the camera, where the shutter speed and the aperture form the regulating mechanism. And even the best camera can only hope to achieve a fraction of the sophistication of the human eye. With the iris seamlessly opening and closing, adapting to varying light conditions. Can we design our building like a camera? Or even better, like the human eye? Lattice stonework fitted in windows, which not only cuts out the excessive glare, but also reduces the intensity. We have seen this in many places, in Gujarat, Rajasthan, the Mughal architecture of the north, many hot countries around the world, especially in the Middle East. In buildings, it is the quality of light which is far more important than the quantity, and what a quality of light this generates. A more modern example, this is a building in Paris, the Arab World Institute, designed by architect Jean Noël, where he has designed the entire southern facade literally like giant camera apertures, which regulate the light depending upon the intensity outside and the requirement inside. Use of daylight in buildings has been proven to have tremendous health benefits, both physical and psychological. The sun is the giver of life. And if we know how to bring sun in the building in a qualitative way, we can enrich life within the building in a nourishing way. The second aspect is thermal comfort. Buildings, like our clothing, are extensions of our skin. Can we wear the same type of clothing in a beach, in a desert, or in the snowy mountains? If not, how can we have the same type of buildings in Mumbai, Jaipur, or a hill station? Common sense suggests that buildings should be designed as per the climate. That those in cold climates should keep us warm, and the buildings in hot climates should keep us cool. In Northern Europe, where winter temperatures are very, very low, they need as much of the sun within the buildings as possible. And we know that glass traps heat 
when we enter a car that has been parked in the sun for too long. Hence, they wrap their buildings around with glass in order to retain the heat inside. But what are these blind imitations of glass boxes doing in a tropical country like India where average summer temperatures in most cities are above 30 degrees Celsius? Aren't we converting our buildings into ovens only to be retrofitted with air conditioners in order to reconvert them into refrigerators? Before we pockmark our buildings with air conditioners, let us think, why can't our buildings themselves behave like air conditioners? Or even better, breathe like the human skin which regulates temperature and controls humidity. All of us know this building. Buildings like the Taj are remarkably cooler in spite of being in hot areas and one of the reasons is the presence of large water bodies either within the campus or beside. Water not only cools the air but also cools the building because it can hold twice the amount of heat as the same volume of stone. Drop a hot stone in water. When you pick it up again after a few hours, it is much cooler. Why? because water has sucked heat out of the stone. Similarly over here, you're draining the heat out of the building through the medium of water, rather than pumping heat out of the building through the medium of air, which is what an air conditioner does. A more modern example, this is a residential building in Pondicherry, designed as a guest house for the Sri Aurobindo Ashram by, by architects from Japan. It's called Goldpunt. Now in Pondicherry, we have three climates, hot, hotter, and hottest. Where do you begin? How do you minimize heat gain and maximize ventilation in such a climate? Orientation. The sun moves from east to west. So here, the longer sides of the building face north and south in order to cut across the path of the sun. Secondly, the breeze. They have tilted the longer sides in order to be exactly perpendicular to the breeze, both land breeze and the sea breeze. And those very facades have been opened up from floor to ceiling through movable lures. So depending upon the time of the day, the location of the sun and the direction of the incoming breeze, the entire building, so to say, opens up almost like a flower in order to allow the breeze to come in. Materials. Instead of using cement, which weakens with time, this building for all internal plasters uses lime, which strengthens with time to become limestone. Hydrated lime, which is calcium hydroxide, absorbs the atmospheric carbon dioxide to become limestone, calcium carbonate, and releases moisture. In effect, this building acts like a tree which absorbs carbon dioxide and releases moisture. And much like the moisture on our human skin, it evaporates and causes the skin of the building to cool down. Breathing walls, these are our bridges to the air. Acoustics. In the words of German philosopher Goethe, Architecture is frozen music, and music is fluid architecture. Can architecture give us the needed environment which can enhance the quality of human conversations by listening deeply? Here is an example of a Greek theater from 400 BC, designed for 14,000 people in the audience, a handful of actors on stage. Needless to say, there were no microphones, amplifiers, or speakers at the time. And yet, every member in the audience was able to listen to the actors and follow the play. Today, can we imagine a gathering even of 300 people in a building being able to listen to you without a microphone? Design of musical instruments can offer us fantastic guidelines for acoustic design of spaces. An example of a hollow space carrying sound, a flute. And perhaps the best organ for receiving sound, the human ear canal. 
Can we design our building like a flute? Or even better, like the human ear canal? This is an institutional building that I designed as part of a team for a rural development program in Pondicherry in South India. Over here, we designed the multi-purpose hall to house 300 people. We were running on a shoestring budget. Supply of electricity was erratic, and I knew that we could not use microphones. So what do we do? We designed the building in such a way that you don't need microphones. Firstly, the roof. Instead of building a flat roof, I designed an arch with the center of the radius falling within the human hearing zone. So the sound reflects and comes back to where the people are seated, which is where it is needed. Secondly, materials. The entire building from foundation to roof has been built with unfired earth from the water pond on the building site itself. So we took the earth from this pond, made bricks with them. These bricks are not fired and made the entire building out of these unfired bricks. Unfired earth responds to sound in a very comfortable, a very soothing manner as opposed to highly polished surfaces. When the roof was ready, you could have a person at one end talking to a large audience and even a person standing at the other end of this huge roof was able to hear him perfectly. Listening roofs, these are our bridges to sound. Violinist and concert master of the Titanic track, Paul Peabody heard about this building and the next time he was in India, in fact he was in Varanasi, he flew down especially to understand the acoustic quality of this space, to experience it as well as to perform his violin underneath it. After the performance he told me, the earth below me has become the sky above me. When I was playing, When I was playing, the earth was listening. Next time you enter a building, ask yourself, is this building intelligent? The idea is not to go back to the past, but to draw from the hundreds of years of research and wisdom and apply it in a modern context in a cutting edge manner. One may ask, if this knowledge already exists, why isn't it being applied? Why do most of our buildings today look dull, repetitive, insensitive? In the words of Winston Churchill, first, we create our buildings. Then, our buildings create us. Eighty percent of our lives we spend inside buildings. And yet, why is there such little artistic or scientific excellence in them? The answer could be from three different viewpoints. One, the user. Lack of awareness on the part of the user about what is possible. That a building doesn't have to be a square foot box. Also, lack of sensitivity on the part of the user with respect to the built environment in general. If the user does not demand quality, the supplier has very little obligation to provide it. Next, the developer's viewpoint. The construction industry today is more about selling square feet than creating homes. And hence, most real estate buildings do not even qualify or not even considered as part of architecture. It is much easier to use standardized materials like cement and steel instead of natural materials like earth and lime, which though more cost effective, require greater skill and knowledge in its usage. And hence, what we see mostly around is largely cosmetic, where ordinary buildings are clad with expensive materials and a misguided notion of luxury as the aim of buildings is being put forth. And thirdly, the building regulations. They look at buildings and cities from a linear top-down standpoint, rather than recognizing them as parts of the larger cyclical loops of nature. 
In the middle of all this, there is a small but a sure change. We call it the sustainability revolution. Not the green eyewash, but a genuine systemic thinking and approach towards holistic design. And it is this approach which is teaching us newer ways continually of making our objects, our buildings, our cities smarter, more sustainable, more meaningful, with tremendous economic, environmental and health benefits, social benefits as well. We are standing at the brink of perhaps one of the most exciting periods of human history and innovation. I believe we have a beautiful future ahead. The question we need to ask ourselves today is, is the future going to be beautiful because of me or in spite of me? Thank you.